I welcome you to the Oliver Baptist Church, but far greater may I welcome you tonight to this gathering of people of faith, uh, people of great minds, intellectual minds, intuitive minds, that God has brought us together. We're in the midst of this crisis, always believe that if there is a problem, God has already raised up the solution. And so thank you from the bottom of my heart just for being here uh, tonight as we come together, have some dialogue, some healthy dialogue, encourage one another as we come together, stand in unity and pray, and whatever else God wants to happen. But I want you to relax and know that you're at home and to uh, enjoy yourself as we spend this time. We're not going to keep you all night, uh, but as we spend this time together. So glad to have our chief here with us, Chief Roddy. Let's give him a hand. Appreciate him being here. And, and you will be meeting others as uh, they come forward. But this time, I'm going to ask Pastor Love if he would just come and cover us with prayer as we don't want to ever start anything without first asking God's presence and God's blessing. Let us pray. Oh God, our help in ages past, we come at this time and this hour knowing that you're the only one that can answer our prayers. In a time of transition, in a time of turmoil, often the question goes, how can we sing in a foreign land? Yeah. But God, we know that we have joy in you that we have trust in you, that we can depend upon you. So while those that are in pain are calling for help, God, we ask that you would send your angels right now to touch each heart, to touch each mind, that all might come upon your accord. God, we ask that you would go even from the White House throughout every street, and we ask that you would bring us to a place that you want us to be, we welcome your spirit right now. Open up our hearts right now. Open up our minds. Help us to show love instead of hatred. Help us to be able to protest in love, but yet not destruction. And Father God, help us to fight for justice. Now God, we ask that you would coat each one represented here under your name. That you will guide our minds, our spirits, and our souls open our hearts right now that we might be able to speak to one another in such a way that we might all understand. And we give you all glory and praise. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. George Floyd, a young man uh, some days ago in Minneapolis, as he's laying on the ground, an officer has his knee on his neck and he is suffocating. He is saying that I can't breathe. He is saying that I'm dying. He's crying out for mama and he dies laying there on the ground. And we've been wondering ever since then, why? Why? And seeing that connected to so many injustices that we have witnessed over the years. We've come to a defining moment in history whereas something has to change, some things have to stop, and some things have to be done new and totally different. I want to ask you tonight, where were you when it happened? You know, it's one of those moments in history like you think about 9-11 and people ask you, where were you when it happened? But then I want to ask you, number two, how did you feel? I've heard all kinds of things, people walking through the house and crying and people in remorse, people weeping because they didn't see a black man, they saw a human being laying on the ground, suffocating, dying. And the last thing, what did you want to do? What did it cause you? What did it birth in you? What actions did it drive you to, to say, I've got to do something? I was so blessed when I heard from Michael um, this Saturday, he was just saying, we got to do something. 
I think everybody is here tonight because we've been feeling this, this overwhelming drive. We got to do something. And to be honest, I don't know what all that is, but it's like we've got to do something. We cannot remain silent. We cannot remain still. Our young people are out on the streets, this millennial age, and they're marching, and I stop and ask them, why are you marching? And they said, because we won't change. And I stood there, and the chief was out there, and I cried. And I said, Lord, I pray that they're not fighting demons that we were supposed to take out in our day. I said, my prayer is that they're not battling and dealing with issues that you raised us up and empowered us that we were supposed to take it out in our day. But now our kids have to get out in the street, and they have to face it and fight it in their day. Even in the midst of this, as the whole world looks on, we see the chaos, we see the opportunists taking advantage of opportunity with the looting and with the rioting. And I keep saying over and over and over again that we must not allow the chaos to override the cause. That we have to stay focused upon the cause. And the real cause is justice for all when there is a threat against justice, right? When there is injustice anywhere, it is a threat against justice everywhere, in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. The last and final thing is the cause itself. What needs to happen? Because we can meet, we can gather, we can keep having powwows and groups but if God doesn't change our heart and if this doesn't turn into fuel that empowers us to say, I got to take a part of this. I've got to own some of this. I've got to go hold some people accountable. I've got to challenge some of my friends who sometimes make little racial uh, jokes or demeaning jokes. I've got to challenge some of my friends and some of my coworkers, even some of my congregants who perhaps thinking is not uh, biblical, thinking is not the way it ought to be, it's not healthy, it's not God. And so something has to happen because the cause is connected to so many underlying things. People are struggling financially, people don't have opportunities, education wise to excel, and you got the underserved and you got people who uh, feel like they, their voices are not being heard and so here we are, this thing has been building like a pressure cooker, like a pressure pot. And now it is exploding all across our nation. And what do we do? We have to rebuild the family. We have to strengthen and make things better for a better day. I got a five-year-old granddaughter, and I'm determined that she won't live in the world that we now know. That when her day comes, we be able to hand over to her a better day, not only for my grandchildren, but for yours. And we'll see one another walking in harmony and love, regardless of race, creed, or color. I ask at this time just a couple of ministers to come alongside of me just for a few minutes. We all got to preach yesterday. Amen. Amen. And, and, and so we don't want to, amen, redo it tonight. And so we could just take a couple of minutes and be sensitive to just a couple of pastors to come and talk about what this, what does this mean? What are we saying? How do you feel? And to express this because so many people keep saying, I don't understand what's this, what's, what's, what, what is all this about? Why are people, you know, marching? Why are people protesting? What's the big deal? So I asked Pastor Jeffrey Wilson from the New United Church. Would he come and just have a few words to share with us? Give him a hand as he comes. Thank you, Thank you Bishop Adams. Uh, it was the late Reverend Dr. William Augustus Jones who made what I think was a powerful statement. And he said the following, he said, don't bring a flute when a trumpet is needed. What we have today, uh, from my perspective, friends, is the need for a voice. A voice that stands beyond political lines, uh, 
extends beyond racial lines, voice that is even bold enough to transcend religious differences, voice that speaks to not only the political injustice, yes, there is need for policy changes, uh, policies that, as many have stated, have been in, in need of change for well over 40 to 50 years. Certainly there is need, as friends and I talk about, for economic change. Right. Much of this, people wonder where is it coming from. I've had similar discussions uh, to Pastor Adams, some of my neighbors who are good people, want to learn, want to know better, and say, I don't understand it. And the point that I gave to one today was the point that Martin Luther King said in his book, uh, Why We Can't Wait. 1964, King said that lightning does not make a sound until it strikes. What we see today, my friends, is lightning striking. I know we're not supposed to generate a sermon, but what we see today is lightning striking across the length and the breadth of this nation. And it's not going to go away, brothers and sisters. It will not silence itself. Dr. Robert Franklin, former president of Morehouse wrote a new book that I'm reading. He talks about moral leadership that is needed. He says moral leadership is courageous leadership. I commend Bishop Adams for convening this gathering. I commend the chief. Uh, many times it's, it's one thing to say what law enforcement is not doing. The mayor said today the chief was out there last night on the front line. And I asked the question today, chief, was the, was the sheriff and others out there. It makes a difference when those in high places are willing to get out. Too often the church has separated itself from the voice of the masses. One of the things that disturbs me during Martin King's day, it was the preachers and the religious leaders who led the cause with the word of God in their hand. Now we have uh, the millennial age, technology, I don't know if it's this group or that group or political left, political right. And everybody seems to have a voice that is being heard except the people of faith. My friends, I thank Bishop for this time and my time is up, but I want to encourage us. Don't bring a flute. Don't bring a flute. We've already brought the flute. What is needed out there is a trumpet trumpet has to make a sound, and not just any sound, but if you played an instrument, one of the worst things you can have is an instrument that is out of tune. We need to be in tune, friends. Not just economic message, we need one. Not just political message, we need one. Not just a social justice message, we need one. But what is needed out there is a moral voice those who are willing to stand up and say that some of what we see is wrong. Stealing, robbing, looting, hurting other folk that have done nothing to you, at the, the bottom line is morally wrong. We've got to speak truth to power, brothers and sisters. We can't be afraid in this hour and, st and tell those whether they want to hear it or not that God Almighty is not pleased. God was not pleased when that foot was on that man's neck. It's against the law, man's law. The coroner said today that the cause of death by asphyxiation, choking, strangulation, but that, that is the coroner's interpretation. God's interpretation says thou shalt not keep it. God is not pleased. Don't bring a flute when a trumpet is needed. One of the things that the whole nation took, um, paid attention to, became aware of, is that as George Floyd was lying on the ground, in those moments he began to cry out for his mother, much as Jesus, as he was hanging on the cross, spoke of his mother and said, Mother, behold your son, son, behold your mother. And there's something about a mother's perspective. This time I'm asked Pastor uh, Shana, Wooten, 
if she would come at this time, a great pastor in our city. I want you to be sensitive in your hearts because she just had a son not too long ago go home to be with the Lord, not through uh, uh, this type of situation, but no less. Uh, she just had a son go home to be with the Lord. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. I do want to uh, say, as uh, Bishop Adams has said, I lost my son um, five months ago through a car accident. And one thing about it is, is that when we target things, it is, uh, we can't be by a flawed perspective because those officers tried to save my son. They did CPR, they worked on him. And they, did, they didn't have to, I wouldn't have known anyway. And so there are people, and they were Caucasian, so there are good people. And so we can't have a flawed perspective. Evil lurks in every color. It just manifests right now through a black man being killed. But evil lurks at all times. And what we have to do is make sure we don't get sidetracked with one spirit when the spirit is not a color, it is a demon. I'll say that again because maybe it went over your head. A spirit is not a color. If we target just the situation with one officer who happens to be Caucasian who killed a black man and not look at people who are killed every single day because of spirits, demons, being possessed with things that are wrong that are not pleasing to God. It is, I'm going to say this, and uh, I was kind of put on the spot, but it's a territorial demon. Yeah. Somebody who feels like they own rights yes. to an area in a region and they feel like they have the right to take it away because it belongs to them. When you believe it's your property, somebody steps on your property, then what do you do? You protect your property, right? And we have rights to do that when we're in certain environments. And so territorial spirits, that's what they did. Cain and Abel was an example of that. Cain murdered um, Abel because he had felt like he was uh, more uh, precious to God. And so he was jealous and so he took him out. We do it every day. We do it all the time. So how do we battle it? How do we com combat it? And I don't, you know, I, I'm, I don't believe that I heard Bishop Adams say, you know, did, is it a demon that we should have fought? I don't think, I think we fought our Goliath, but Goliath had brothers. And those brothers, and when it came against the anointing, it came against David, the Bible says that they were, uh, they were out in war, and the, the brothers of Goliath raised up, they were giants, they raised up, and they almost slew, they almost slew David, but David had properly prepared those who were standing with him. And so they were able to defeat the brothers of Goliath and allow David to rest because they didn't want the light of Israel to go out. That's why God put certain people in certain places who have not rose up and did what they were called to do, glory to God, not just what they like to do, but what they were called to do was to fight the giants that are in society that is trying to destroy God's people or people. If you don't believe you're God people and you just happen to be here, that you're people, there are people in leadership that is supposed to protect. Now, if we don't push them to protect it, then they'll close their eyes. And the only reason why it's such a big chaos is because it was done right on TV and that's how demons are. They'll begin to get bolder and bolder and bolder because they felt like nobody would have done that if they didn't feel like they would not have consequences. And because sometimes we feel like we don't have consequences, we are relaxed with doing things that are wrong. Answer to that is this. Raise up people. We need to pray and raise up people and be involved and raise up people. Pray that God will raise up people who will do what is right when it comes to justice. That it will not be flawed and, and one, one person get this and another person get that, but it will be the proper perspective from all the way to the top, all the way to the bottom, that we would do what's right and that we would quit shutting our eyes to things that are not right because it's not in our house. This happened to be in our house because we're black, he's black. However, things are happening every single day in our communities, in our lives. People are being stopped, they shouldn't be stopped, and now I'm going on. People are being uh, messed with, they should not be messed with, and nothing has ever been said. But until we start saying it with a small... things that we have noticed around the country that it has not just been black people on the streets 
uh, protests, and it has been, in many cases, more whites uh, who've been turning out and supporting and standing for the cause. Uh, what do you do as a pastor, as a leader, when you are responsible for people? Do you feel like you have a responsibility to also hold them accountable, uh, to walk in uh, racial harmony, to be fair, and do you challenge them from the pulpit as a pastor? Because it's one thing for us to come here and talk to one another, but do we actually go to our congregations and say, listen, one of the boldest moves I've seen do this is, is that man right over there, our, our police chief, who came so strong to, to tell them that any man who didn't feel like that that was, you know, that that was out of line, that that was unlawful, he said, you need to turn in your badge. What would churches be like? And said, if you're calling yourself uh, a parishioner here and a child of God, but you're going around and saying all of these racial things and racist things and things that, that disharmonize, I don't consider you, you, have, you know, you're out of fellowship with God and out of fellowship with this local church. I want to ask a uh, good friend, and then I'm going to turn it over to my friend, your Michael, but I want uh, 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 Pastor Bishop, uh, my good friend Wallace, because I know he pastors a, a multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic uh, congregation to address that uh, issue, that as pastors, what happens when you, you know, do, do we address our congregation and hold them accountable? First of all, Bishop, thank you for letting us be here and for convening this meeting. And I think it would be easy for us to address these issues, or at least easier, if we did them in homogenous environments mm -hmm. where everybody is the same mm -hmm. and where everyone looks the same and speaks mm -hmm. the same language. But it's especially, especially challenging some call it towing the line. I think it's just being faithful to the gospel to speak the truth. The truth has no side. The truth is its own side. And sometimes we create cultures and environments where our truth is the truth. I have found out that when I speak the truth, I'm going to inevitably tick someone off who is not interested in the truth. They're interested in someone who supports their version of the truth. So on Sundays when we are not dealing with a national calamity and I bust the spirit of racism and I address the issues of white supremacy notions in America, I got white folk who don't understand why I would mention such a thing. And the African-American family in our church, they get it. On other Sundays where I have to stand up and I have just preached the funeral of someone who was murdered and I have to talk about how this happened and the pain of it all and I'm dealing with a white family that is weeping and I have to, then it's the weirdness that comes into the room. And the reason is we really haven't preached the kind of kingdom of God where all of us understand ourselves as one family. It's still them and us. But the reason God has helped us, and I give him the glory, is because when you preach the kingdom, it doesn't resonate with everyone. But there are people who are listening because they want a message that pulls them out of the cesspool of defeatism, the feeling that there is no tomorrow, and I have found the only way to build a church that is a multicultural church is to preach a kingdom that is superior to our cultures. Because the kingdom of God is the kingdom for people no matter the color of their skin, no matter where they were born, no matter their place on the socioeconomic uh, place on the ladder. And so when you preach the kingdom, everybody begins to say, I can be a part of that. And if you're a white supremacist, you can get saved. And, 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 and if, you're, if you're someone who's full of hate and rage, you can get born again. I, I'm ashamed to tell you. I'm thankful, but I'm ashamed to tell you. I came from a long line of white supremacists. 
But when Jesus saved me, he changed my life and made me love everybody. And, and this is the thing I'm concerned about, Bishop, and I will take my seat. I am concerned that we preach a Jesus who likes us, but not a Jesus who came to save the whole world. And if we preach a Jesus who came to save the whole world, then why should it shock us or be an anomaly? When we look out into our congregations on Sunday and we see red and yellow, black and white, because if we preached him right, and we've embraced his kingdom appropriately, it will call people from every walk of life, every color, and we will all find a place at the table of the Lord. And can I read a scripture before I say, I, I, I'm not going to preach. This was yesterday. Uh, but but I, can't, I can't do this. With, this is what gave me strength because I'm not here tonight because I have all the answers. I'm here tonight because you're my brother. That's my brother. You're hurting and I'm hurting with you. And we're weeping. And I didn't come just to weep and give empathy. I need strategy. We need strategy in America now. Need leadership in America now so that we can move past the wounds and get to some resolution. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes came up on me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should come against me, my heart shall not fear. War may rise up around me, but this, in this will I be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire of his holy temple. And this is the scripture that blessed me. I would have fainted unless I had believed. I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, I know when we get to heaven, we're going to get down and we're going to be happy together. But David said, I, I made it on this side. I, I was sustained on this side because I believed I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And I just want to declare, I'm not going to wait till I get to heaven to see equality and unity and peace. We're going to work in our generation until we see the goodness of God manifested now so that our sons and daughters and grandchildren live a very different life than the one that we've seen on the news stations the last several days. As Michael is coming, come here for one minute, Jonathan, because I need you to do something right as Michael is coming, because we're in, a, uh, we're in, a, in an interesting place as pastors because we want to support these millennials who have so much energy and they want to get out of here and they, they're, you know, they're demanding change and they won't take no for an answer. But at the same time, we're getting all of this, you know, encouragement from media outlets and say, uh, you need to address the looting, you need to address the, riot, the rioting. So how do we do that? How do we, you know, at the same time tell, tell young people, make sure you're not a part of that. And we understand a lot of that that's coming in is people who are being brought in. Amen. We found that out from different places, but at the same time, not kill their spirit from making a stand. Again, thank you, Bishop. Thank you, uh, Michael, my good friend, uh, Chief. Good to see you. Uh, one way we have to deal with it is we have to understand their anger. Okay. Now, I'm going to say some things that it, it may rather your feathers, maybe, but this is not a preaching moment. This is demonstration moment. And what they're needing is to see us saying, hey, we understand your concern. Because so far, we have not dealt with the fact that these murders are constantly happening all right and this is just what we do see what about the murders that have not been seen what about the uh, the stops that nobody heard about you know we're, we're, we're you know where's the outrage for Breonna Taylor in her home sleeping and she shot eight times what about uh, Ahmaud Arbery who just did something I do a lot. You go in a house and look, didn't steal anything, 
but you're gunned down like you're an animal. These young people are hurt. And I'm going to be transparent. I was hurt so bad last week because to see, and this is not all police officers, because I know plenty of them, but to see this man's knee on his neck and then his hand in his pocket like he's killed a deer or something with no remorse is troublesome. And if we say that, hey, we love God, and, and yes, I believe in the kingdom of God, but we need to change what kingdom we preaching if it's not a kingdom that understands that, hey, God's kingdom trumps any nationality, any ethnicity that's in the land that is not from God. Because there's a lot of kingdoms out here. There's a lot of kingdoms out here. So in order for us to deal with these social issues, there's got to be strategic plans. There's got to be a change in policies. There's got to be change in legislation. Whether we're Republican or Democrat, because we don't have leaders right now. We don't have no leaders. I don't care what side of the fence you're on with that. Whether it's Republican or Democrat, we need people that's going to represent the people and not have self-interest of what they're wanting in this United States of America. We also need to deal with laws that have been put in place. And, and I, I read an article Saturday in the USA Today called Immun immunity, Applied Im Immunity, which is a law that suggests that police officers are shielded for certain kind of activity. That must change. It is my understanding that it's before the Supreme Court this month. It needs to be eradicated. Because if you break the law, you should do the time. Now, I don't condone looting. I don't condone damaging people's property. But we got to have strategic ways that we address this. This is 2020. Why are we again dealing with something that's been going on year after year after year? And I challenge every clergy in here. We don't need no more cowards in the pulpit. We don't need no more people being in the pulpit preaching and just acting like everything is fine when it's not. We need truth. We need truth. This is not just a black problem. This is not just a white problem. This is not just a Hispanic problem. This is a humanity problem. And we must do something about it. So these millennials need our support. I talked to some of them last night and I said, looky here, while you sitting there doing it, you need to watch how you govern yourself. It's all right to have peaceful protests. But if I say something wrong to Chief Roddy, who had nothing to do with it, I, nothing that I know of he's ever done anything that has been, and I, we've been knowing each other for years, then I'm wrong to call him out of his name. I'm wrong to cuss him. Y'all don't say, I'm just telling you the truth. So we have to do better. Now I'm encouraged tonight by all of this difference that is in this room because this is a picture of what heaven gonna look like if we are right with Jesus. Okay, let me just be clear because how can I say, the scripture says this, how can I say, I love God and I hate my brother. That's right, John. How can I say that? That's right, John. And so therefore we have to check ourselves. Yes, What's in our heart? What's in my heart? What am I saying behind closed doors? And we need each and every one of you to check people when they're saying things that are not right. I don't care who it's from. We must do it. And I say this in love. I don't say this out of anger. I don't say this out of hatred. I just want to see us all 
represent properly. Everyone need to, if we're going to sit here and say abortion is wrong, but we're not saying this type of murder is wrong, you're hypocrites. You can't have it both ways. Can't have it both ways. Can't have it both ways. So my prayer is, is that we deal with these issues when it comes to the millennials. That first of all, they know they have our support, but we have to guide them in the right way to be angry and sin not, which I haven't mastered yet. I ain't gonna lie to you. But we have to let them know, yes, we hear your concern, we understand it, and we need to tell them what we are doing. They may be out there protesting, while we're somewhere meeting and speaking truth to power, saying we demand change. God bless you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michael Dezik, and I'm with the Jewish Federation. I'm absolutely honored to be in this room with all of the clergy. I'm not clergy myself, but I am honored that you are here. Men, women, all faiths, all cultures, all races. And I extend my hand right now to the African-American community. From the bottom of my heart, your struggle is my struggle. Bishop Adams, I want to thank you for your friendship and your strength to stand with your fellow community members and open up your home tonight. Everyone here watching from home, I hope there's hundreds if not thousands out there watching tonight, we're stronger. We have a voice because of leaders like yourself. I want to thank my wife, Paula, who gave me the encouragement to lead and help create this event tonight with you. My family will always stand up against hate. We will never be neutral. Like so many of you, and I'm sure many of you at home, I feel helpless. I feel frustrated and I am angry. How do we turn this hate into hope and inspiration though? So earlier today I watched a video on YouTube. It was an African American uh, video of some parents and they were talking to their children about how to act and what to do when their children are in the presence of police. Several of the kids were crying, listening to their parents' stories, getting hugs from their dads and their moms. And I couldn't believe it. I never imagined African-American parents are teaching their kids that they have to do these types of things. But it's nothing new for the African-American community. I know that now. This is something that's been going on for generations. Because of skin color, it is time for laws to be passed, policies to change and it is time for a drastic cultural change. This man right here, he is my friend, Kevin. He's not my black friend, Kevin. He's Kevin, he's my friend. And I am Michael, I am your friend. I'm not your Jewish friend, Michael, I'm just Michael. We can create a more loving and inclusive community and we can do it together with overflowing of justice and equality. Now, we've talked about this, Bishop Adams, back in the 60s. Who stood shoulder and shoulder with, with the, with the African-American community? It was the Jewish community. Rabbi Heschel stood arm in arm with Martin Luther King Jr. on so many of those marches. And as a Jew, I am taught that it is my duty and it is my obligation to stand up for anyone being persecuted and I will not remain silent. Silence only encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Something that Ellie Wiesel said. The events in Minneapolis last week, the murder of George Floyd, has exposed a generation worth of racism that exists in this country. This is not the America that I will accept. Racism is not something that I accept. In a moment, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to light this candle in, in memory of George Floyd. And there's so many others that we've heard tonight of the senseless and hate-filled murders before him. And it is my hope that we're taking one step towards change, empowerment, to feel uplifted, to feel supported, to feel valued, 
and I've heard this so many times tonight, to be heard. We've got to be heard. As leaders of this multi-faith community, I pledge to you to stand with each of you to fight all forms of hate. May the memory of George Floyd always be for a blessing. My name is Bassem Isa. I'm from the Islamic Society of Greater Chattanooga. And I'm here uh, with a heavy heart. And I remember one of the verses in the Quran where it says, who who kills a soul or a human being as if he killed all humanity? Amen. And who saves that life as if he saved all humanity? So, uh, George Floyd, peace be upon him, he was killed. And whoever killed him as if he killed all humanity. We, we look at the video and, you know, eight minutes, 46 seconds, two and a half minutes or more with no movement. And you tell me, that is not killing on purpose. There's no way. Why probably 50% of why everybody's out there as a nation, not just blacks, everybody out there protesting this. Because when you look at it, all week I've been thinking about it. You just can't believe a human being would do that when you have four people that have arms, one handcuffed, and on the ground, why would you need eight, nine minutes to apprehend somebody and put them in a car? It's unbelievable. So with that, we need to move on though, is the fact that this shows one thing for us as a nation. This is not a black and white issue. And we do not know what was in the mind of the killer. But whether he, it was about black or not black, I mean, we have so many killings of black by uh, other officers across the nation, but we have a ton. I mean, we look at that, but we also should never look at the police officer as being an enemy. Because everybody I know, I've been here 47 years, and I'm a different skin, I'm brown skin. I have never, uh, even in the past time, in 70s, in 80s, never uh, found in my dealings, even when I have been stopped when I was younger, person I have had maybe as many as five, seven tickets. And I have been stopped by different people, uh, different police people. I have always been treated fairly. So I, I cannot judge people of what was in his mind. Whatever he's done, he killed George Floyd on purpose. This is my conclusion from what I see. And what made things really worse is the fact that uh, Whoever in government was so slow to act and came up even with something that's really not in most states, that third degree thing, that's really, and, and even put around with it, manslaughter, which is ridiculous. So thinking maybe a jury, one jury is gonna say, well, let's just go with the one manslaughter, whatever it is. Instead of saying from day one, let's put first degree murder and let the jury decide because it looks like it's the first you know, uh, degree murder. But meanwhile, I uh, also look at the great examples, uh, and I, I've been living here in Chattanooga, so I haven't seen other cities, but I, I know uh, Chief Roddy and Chief Fletcher before him, and the people before that. And I think Chief Roddy was there last night giving cards, trying to understand people. But where do we go from here today? Uh, the nation, you would not believe. I, I watch world news all day, every day. And I'm so ashamed and I feel so hurt of how they look at us as a nation. How bad they, they laugh at us for the fact that uh, we hear any little thing happen in any other country. Uh, when people go in the streets 
and we make it so big in the news here and the political system that look at that country, that country that's not democratic. That's what they do for their own people. That's, they kill them, they do whatever. They, but here, they're laughing at us of how we're reacting. Uh, on the one hand, you've got riots along with the good, peaceful uh, you know, demonstrations. So how can the police deal with that? He, they cannot let these people go and, or some of these very few people to go and do something, uh, burn something, uh, destroy property. And yet, I start thinking, what can we do? And I don't know, maybe I'm a dreamer, but uh, Chief Roddy, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm not uh, really, you know, understand it. But is there a way on a night like tonight or any other night, instead of the police being on one side and protesters on one side, is the police themselves go among the protesters and also protest? And even they may get hurt a little bit at first because they may not be understood. But maybe somebody would say, hey, we're coming here to protest with you. You want to do whatever to us, do whatever you want to do to us as policemen do. We're with you, we feel your pain, and go in the middle of them and be with them. Maybe they would not riot, or some of them, or maybe even they'll be watching each other not to go and, and uh, do looting or whatever. But get them to uh, like be on their side rather than be two sides and uh, make problem worse because we know there's always in every crowd somebody that's not good and they're gonna create things on purpose. But the most of the people, they are gonna be hurting and they want answers. So, but uh, I don't wanna be long, but I think the biggest problem is it's poor versus uh, rich in the sense that most of the problems happen uh, is based on the fact when people don't have money, they end up being uh, at disadvantage where they might do something uh, uh, to survive. And all the violence that happens usually in neighborhoods, whether it's black, Hispanic, uh, or whites. So maybe the culture needs to change because across the country, uh, most uh, of what of us or the police, whatever, think, well, where most of the violence comes from these neighborhoods. It's not because they're blacks, it's not because they're Hispanic, it's because they're poor and they haven't got enough education, they haven't got enough opportunity, things happen. So that's what we need to change on the long term, but at, at this moment, can we do something to make those people, young people, feel that we're with them? That's the question. Thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, Rabbi Craig Lewis from the Mitzvah Congregation. Again, I'd like to thank Bishop Adams and Michael Dezik for arranging this meeting. And I want to uh, begin by just echoing what Michael said. Jews in 2020 and for many years have been inspired to continue to be inspired by the friendship, the genuine friendship between Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr and they march together. And so I come here tonight to pledge our ongoing support because we mourn with you. We grieve with all who are sad and frightened and afraid all around our country. In this room, watching at home or out in the streets protesting, we stand with you. I also want to say something, and I'm very glad that Chief Roddy is here is that I wanted to say that no matter what, no matter how angry anybody is, wherever we are, we need the police. We need to be friends with them. We need them to be our friends. And I want to say from a, a bit of a personal place, there is an off-duty officer who stands outside of my congregation during many of our services. It so happens that he is an African-American man, and he's standing guard over a predominantly white congregation. And he has become very much like a part of our family. People give him hugs, shake hands. All of our volunteers are trying to feed him at all times. And I never miss an opportunity to tell him directly how grateful I am for him. And he says humbly that it's an honor but it's truly I who am honored. Because I know it is no small thing for him to stand out there and be willing to risk his own safety to protect me, 
protect my family and our congregation. And so it is I who am always honored and humbled to know him. And it shows that he understands what it means truly to protect and serve. And we need more officers, officers like him who recognize the honor it is to wear the badge, to represent our city, and to protect and serve all of our citizens. So, and I hope everyone is listening. We do not need an end for the police, but we do need for a police all around our country to change. We need systems of accountability. As our own Chief Roddy has said, the bad apples should turn in their badges, and that would be a great start. We know that the wheels of justice for George Floyd have turned far too slowly. We also know that those are the same wheels of justice that have failed for a long, long time. Had they been sped up for any past injustice, when black men and women were treated unfairly, and they were met with unnecessary suspicion and excessive force, if at any point with Eric Garner, Philando Castile, Oscar Grant, Stephon Clark, Breonna Taylor, and the list goes on, if at any point then that justice had been swift, if the officers had been held accountable, then policies would have changed along with the attitudes. If at any point our country had chosen to listen to what Colin Kaepernick was trying to say, an understanding that his love for America was genuine and true, instead of slandering him the way that they did, if we'd understood that he kneeled for the things that America is supposed to stand for, for liberty and justice for all. If at any of those points we had acted speeding up the wheels of justice, then maybe the streets across America would be quiet and we would be at peace. And it's on that theme of peace that I want to share. I know you said that everybody preached yesterday. I preached Friday, so I'm a little fresher, <laughs> okay? <laughs> There's a lesson in the Jewish tradition. Jewish communities around the world are studying the words of the priestly benediction this week. Numbers 6, 24 through 26. And it begins, may God bless and keep you. And it ends with the prayer that God will bring you peace. In our Jewish sources, there's a beautiful teaching that's appropriate and it speaks to this painful time in history. It explains what blessing is. It tells us that blessing is like it says in Psalm 128, that your children will be like olive plants. And that means that olives on a branch are not all the same. Some of the olives are used for making oil. Others are best for eating. Others are better for being dried. The olives are not the same, but every single one of them is valuable. Every olive, like every child, is different, and each one has the potential for greatness when they are free to grow, to learn, and to apply their skills. Each one is precious and deserves the right to discover what they will become. And so from this we learn. It is diversity that is our blessing. And Psalm 128 continues with a prayer that you will enjoy this blessing into the future, that you will live to see your children's children. Every generation should have the opportunity to advance even farther than the one before. And we learn from this, it is imperative that we nurture our blessings for ourselves and for everyone so that those blessings can thrive. And here, here is the most important piece of the lesson. When we treat each fruit of our branches 
if we look to every child and person as inherently having value and potential, when we allow them to grow and succeed, it tells us in Psalm 128, that's when the world will know peace. And from this we learn peace can only come when we embrace our blessings, allowing them to live and, yes, to breathe, and allowing them to perform their unique role in the world. And it tells us without any single one of them, our world is not complete. And it concludes with the benediction. And so I say this in prayer for all of my friends gathered in the sanctuary, for everyone watching on the internet, for families and friends grieving wherever you are, for those frightened and afraid, for all of you protesting. Let us all pray this on your behalf. We pray, may God bless you and keep you because each and every one of you is worthy of life and blessing. Let us say, Amen. May God's face shine upon you with kindness, sustaining you in blessing with every single breath of your life. And let us say, Amen. And may God's countenance rise up to you, surrounding you in love and safety, so that you can share in bringing the world to peace, which is the greatest blessing of all that shalom should reign upon us. And let us say, Amen. And again we say, Amen and Amen. Thank you very much. May God bless us all, and may we all know safety and peace soon. Before we conclude, I really um, want to thank and invite Chief David Roddy to come up and say a few words. Um, kind of putting you on the spot a little bit. Um, you've been in the spotlight a lot, and personally, I want to say thank you. Um, not just as my high school uh, classmate, but also for all that you're doing for the city and all that um, I think you're putting yourself out there on the front line. So thank you for being with us tonight and a few words. Thank you, Michael. Um, I came to two quick epiphanies sitting here. One, I grew up in the Episcopal Church. I spent every Sunday sitting in a wooden pew for countless hours listening to services, in my mind complaining about how uncomfortable that pew is. I also haven't had the opportunity to sit in a church for months now, and this is actually the first time I've had the opportunity to do that. I will never complain about the comfort level of a pew again because I've missed it more than I thought I would. The second epiphany is, is I didn't think this through. Uh, Michael and, and Bishop Adams reached out to me and asked me if I would take a few moments to speak to you all. And as I sat here, I suddenly realized that wasn't very smart because I'm getting up to speak in a room full of people that are professional public speakers and routinely <laughs> blow the roof off of the building that they're talking in. And then you want me to get up and say something motivational. So I feel, I feel woefully inadequate today. Uh, the second thing I want to pass, or third, is a reflection. Something about a tweet or something happened recently. And one of the things, one of the replies, one of the responses that I got back and it started to gain a little repetition was, I hope you understand how outnumbered you are in your profession. I hope you understand how few people that wear that badge feel the same way. That could not be farther from the truth. Since I made that statement, and I'm not here, I don't want to spend time on the statement itself. It is what it is. But I have had countless members of my police department, your police department, this community, neighboring communities, friends of mine across the country who are in law enforcement who said, thank you. You said what we believe. So my reflection to you all, if it helps frame the conversations coming at us, I'm not a minority. I'm not the small number. I'm not the lone quiet voice. I'm many, many more. Of us. The other part I want to give you is a hope. 
last night I was standing in the street in the middle of Fraser Avenue about 2.30 in the morning. And I had taken the opportunity to engage many of the individuals that, as it was placed, were on the other side of the line from us. And in that conversation, a young man said, what bills are being passed? What legislation is being done? What change are you doing? And of course, my first response, with a little bit of police ingrained sarcasm was, nothing, I'm standing here with you in the middle of the street at three in the morning, so I'm really not getting much done in the office. But my second part to him was, you don't want me to build that by myself. Whatever it is that you picture, whatever expectations you have, whatever problems that you know, feel in your heart that we should address as a nation, as an industry, you have to be part of that conversation. Because if you leave it to me and those like me to create an, the solution, we won't find it because we don't know what all the issues are. So my hope to him was, what I expressed back to that young man and the other groups of young men and women that were sitting there, and my officers that were standing with me when I said it, was the thing that I hope, the thing that I look forward to is when we get to sit down and talk. Not stand across the street from one another, not scream at each other, not throw rocks at one another, not do everything we can to push each other away from one another, I look forward to the time that we can sit down with each other to where I'm not a blue uniform and a badge and you're not the person staring at me through the glass on the car that I just pulled over. My name's David and that's what I want you to get to know about me. Now the last thing I'll leave you with is I came to a bit of a realization as well. Um, some of you in here are not true to your words. I am not going to stand up here and preach today, but I heard a few of you say that up here and I don't think you stuck to that. <laughs> the realization was that I'm grateful that you didn't and it means a lot that I was able to hear everything in here tonight. Thank you all. I am honored to be your police chief. There's one thing that hasn't been said that I feel like definitely needs to be said. Uh, it's sad that it has to be said. Black lives matter. And if you haven't said that, and many of you have, at your churches or among your friends, or if you always have to explain it away, then you need to say it more. This is the, the good trouble kind of thing. It's going to make people mad. You're going to have to say, I am privileged. I have white privileges. It's different to be me than to be Chris. Come on, Chris. Does our police department need work? Yes, every police department needs work. He gets harassed. I don't. I get pulled over for having expired tags. I get a warning. He gets pulled over when there's nothing going wrong. We have a fantastic police chief, which means we're poised to have an even better police department. But people are still being harassed in Chattanooga. And if we gloss over that here and then think we're going to go connect with the people in the streets, forgive it up. Forget about it. I also didn't hear, and we didn't have, I mean, obviously, this is not about who has spoken, but there's a lot of repentance that needs to happen in this country as well. For 400 years, we've been saying black lives don't matter, do not matter for 400 years, and we're going to act like we don't need to say it. It has to be said. Last thing, though. How did Heschel say we should be praying with what? Our legs. Our legs. Our feet. Praying with our feet. Right. And you said, let's get out there. Right? You said get out there. Faith leaders used to be out there with the Bible. Well, there's people at Miller Plaza right now. Are they rallying the way that, that I would organize? No. But we have an opportunity. We're here, and it's just down MLK. I'd love for some of y'all to walk with me down there. Rioting is the sound of people feeling unheard. That's king. Let's go here. Let's go show them maybe another way to stand. I hope that you will. And Chris. First to my bishop and 
to Brother Michael, to everyone that is here tonight. Thank you all so much for being here. To Chief Roddy, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, had the opportunity to listen to Dr. Harold Millerbrooks one time, who uh, marched with Dr. King, a civil rights leader that still is living in Knoxville, Tennessee. He stated these words, and I quote, he said, together we stick, divided we're stuck. Together we're stick, divided we're stuck. And what he was meaning by that is, we have to figure out how to come together as a people to sit down and figure out what the issues are and make sure that we make change. A lot of people talk, but a lot of people don't use their faith, which are their feet. Here it is, in this season, in this day and time, what we need is not just to talk about the table, but to create the table for all of us to come to and to speak truth to power and be able to change policy. For if policy doesn't change, none of the things that we talked about tonight change, but it's gonna take men and women of faith and from different racial ethnicities and things of that nature to use whatever platform God has given you to speak truth to power and to be able to make change like never before. Here it is, if we don't make change, we're gonna have this for our children and our children's children, but we have the opportunity now to make a change. And I wanna say this one more time and I'm gonna put the mic down. For those who wanna march with us tonight or come out there, Let's love on those who are out there. Figure out who the leaders are from the millennial generation and from your generation and from every generation, and let's create a table where we can make change to policy. I wanna leave with this. If we don't have the right people at the table, then we're on the menu. God bless you. I'm blessed immensely. Uh, tonight has just been historic and epic, and it couldn't happen without all of you. Give all of yourselves a hand. I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, so I thank Michael, who's the brains behind all this. I didn't do nothing. He, he's just being so humble, but I didn't do anything but just open up the doors. But thank him for organizing and, and the Lord putting it upon his heart to bring us together. Good to see my good friend, Pastor Brad Whitaker. Amen. St. Paul. That's my brother. St. Paul Episcopal Church. I love him. And I just thank God for him. Pastor Ron Phillips. And his son is pastor there now, and he preached a, a sermon many years ago, tearing down the wall. And he, some of y'all remember that. He had all of those walls on stage, and he was tearing a different one down every Sunday, and he tore down the walls of racism. So as we leave this place, we still got some walls to tear down. <laughs> and uh, they're stubborn, but they will come down. I would be remiss if I did not ask uh, Mr. Dave Warland is among us who works in the governor's office and represents the faith base. As we all stand together, we can't hold hands because amen, we're self distance and we're respecting uh, COVID. Thank you so much again, Chief. Uh, have people all, give him a hand. Have people in California, I was telling them, Oakland, calling and talking about this chief who made such a bold statement. And I was like, that's our chief. I was smiling, so, so proud of him. But I'm going to ask if Mr. Dave Waller would come and uh, share a few uh, words with us and then close us out with prayer. We can all stand and uh, prepare as he comes. But thank you so much. Let's see. Uh, works with the governor uh, hand in hand and represents the faith day. Thank you so much. I just want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you for speaking out, for being honest with who you are. And I will tell you that... Uh, I mean, this is not a political issue, but I will tell you, hearing the governor's heart, he is hearing you, and he wants to hear you. Somebody talked a minute ago about policy, and I will tell you that when people are silent, legislators don't know what to do. If you will speak out to your legislators, they are the ones that bring policy. They are the ones that make change in that arena, and I would encourage you to use that voice that you have. It is a powerful voice. It is a respected voice, so please do that and be faithful in that. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you have come here tonight and that you have gathered with us. You have let your words be spoken. You have let your heart be poured out. Lord, there are people in this city that are hurting, and there are people in this city that love you and that care for you, and they want to bring that healing. Lord, we praise you. We thank you for who you are. We ask that you would be with us tonight. That tonight, 
as we leave here, Lord, that our hearts would be changed, that tonight, as we engage other people in our daily walk, whether it's tonight or tomorrow, that, Lord, we would represent you, not ourselves. We would represent you. And we would be mindful of the words that we speak. We would be mindful of not only our rights that we have, but the responsibility that we have and the respect that we give one another. Lord, that is going to speak loudly to this next generation when brothers and sisters from different races, from different cultures, from different religions can come together with respect and care for one another. And Lord, I pray especially that this would not end tonight, that this would not end when the media ends their interest in this and it wanes and goes on to something else but that, Lord, what has begun here tonight, what has been going on these days, would spark something that would bring lasting change. Lord, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We ask that you would bless and be with us. Give us the boldness and the courage that you will. Lord, we ask for that tonight. It's in your holy and precious name we pray.